a Siddha, an accomplished being, who only lived in that little cave of his. That he would not step out of his den, would not mingle with the people of the village. One day, Milarepa's sister found out about her brother. So she goes there with one of her friends. So she cries seeing her brother in that state and um, she says, why are you doing this to yourself? There are other monks we have seen in the village. They speak with people, they speak nice words, they evoke beautiful emotions in people's hearts. They appear quite wise. Why can't you do the same? Why can't you help the society? Milarepa said, that is their way, not Milarepa's. I do my work from this cave. And there was not a thread on Milarepa's body at that time. He was stark naked. So his sister went away and then the next time she saw him again, she got some um, a jumper hand woven. And Milarepa cut it in different pieces and covered his fingertips and toes with that. She said, that's an absurd way of putting on some clothes. This was to hide your body. This was to hide your private parts. And Milarepa said, this is your conditioning. Are you ashamed of yourself? When did this body awareness arise in you? This is social conditioning. I don't buy into it. I don't step out in the world. I just sit here and this is how I, how I help people. So Milarepa was the kind of yogi who helped just by being there. So much so that even after so many hundreds of years, we are recounting his stories. Think about that. And there are 100,000 songs of Milarepa beautifully written on enlightenment, awakening, and meditation, and Mahamudra, and so on. So some people feel that they have to mingle with the world to help. But some yogis are like the sun. They just shine from a distance and help people that way. It boils down to individual choice. But it's a bliss if you taste it. You know, if you eat in a very nice, clean place, let's say you eat in a five-star restaurant. After that, if you eat street food, you'll like the taste once or twice. But you will find it hard to eat that food on a daily basis. Now you've gotten used to very spick and span places where everything is presented nicely, where food is cooked by experts, it's um, served by experts. So once you get used to that level of service, to come down, it's always hard. So once you taste the bliss of solitude, the bliss of sadhana, the taste of the Himalayas, then it's incredibly hard. I once read this thing, there was a, in a neighborhood, somebody had a, a bulldog and it was always barking. And there was a, a, a kid next door who always wanted to see what the dog looked like. But this dog was always guarded with you know long, high fence. One day he couldn't contain himself and he climbed up the fence to take a peek and he tipped over. When he tipped over, you can imagine, the bulldog said, meal. The bulldog didn't say that, so the bulldog charged at this little kid, but he was rescued just in time. And everybody asked him, are you okay, are you okay, did he bite you? He said, no, but he just tasted me a little. <laughs> there was no biting, but there was a bit of taste. So once you taste even a little bit of taste, all noise quietens down completely. And I can only give you my own example. 
not that I am a yogi or accomplished yogi or anything like that, but it's been almost nine years since I came back from the Himalayas. Even till date, I struggle to cope with noise. Whenever I travel, noise gets to me. And it took me five months. I did that exercise in 2017 in intense solitude here for five months. I trained myself to decrease my sensitivity of light. Prior to that, if I had to take a nap, if there was even one tiny light anywhere in the room, I just could not sleep. Day or night. If there's an air conditioner, I would put a little tape so I cannot see that red light or green light blinking at night or lit up. Every little ounce of light, if I would stay somewhere, I would ensure a complete blackout, which was a great pain for people to arrange all that, to put blackouts in hotels and so on. So it took me five months just to get used to light. This was six years after I came back. And in, on 3rd of June, I descended from my place. And after that, on 24th of September is when I made the first contact. So June, July, August, September, nearly. Four months it took me to train my mind to be able to speak to somebody. It took me four months to train my mind to handle another person's presence. So when you really train your body, mind, and consciousness in the in Himalayan solitude, then the challenge of living in the world magnifies to unimaginable proportions. And that's why it's better to just live in the Himalayas. I'll just tell you one little thing. I met this person there when I was there, where my cave was uh, opposite, on the opposite end there was another cave. Somebody said there is a, a person who lives there. So before I started my sadhana, I went and met him. He was a Japanese guy. <laughs> and he had been living there for uh, six years. And every summer, six months, he would spend in that cave. A very sweet person. Somebody not aspiring to be a yogi, somebody not trying to do any, any tough kriyas or anything, but somebody who was completely at peace with himself. And he lived such frugally that even some of the greatest yogis in front of him would be called opulent. He just had uh, a radio. He said, I love listening to the radio. And he had somehow found a way to listen to BBC or something like that. I forgot what he said. And he had his chai pani arrangement. And um, he would bring his own uh, groceries. Every 40 days or 50 days, he would go down to Badruna, get some groceries, noodles and all that, and he would come up. He would not talk to anybody. He would never go down engaging in conversation with anybody. And he was just completely at peace within himself. So the Himalayas have a lot to offer. You can live your whole life in the Himalayas with very little resources. I mean, your monthly expense in the Himalayas, if you really are just living there, you could be living there in less than $50 a month. But you'll just be getting by. Um, no niceties in that. Niceties of the tongue. Really, that's the only thing somebody needs. Good food. Um, everything else, I mean, how many clothes can you wear after all? And if you sit like this, in this posture, once you get used to, your energies are aligned. Believe me, cold is never an issue. When I'm working in my cottage, I need full sleeves. But when I'm sitting like this, I don't need anything. So that's my answer. I hope I answered your question. Thank you.